Within these walls lies the heart of the greatest military power since the days of Imperial Rome. The Pentagon, a symbol of glory and respect, a target of distrust and fear. You have to first and foremost make sure that you're the biggest dog on the block. The people within are charged with the defense of the United States, but their actions reach across the globe. The best protection we could possibly provide the American people is killing and destroying the people that would kill us. The Pentagon must act when called upon in complex times of uncertain outcome. If you're going to put people's lives at risk, you better have a darn good reason. And you better know what that reason is. And you know why you're doing it. It must act despite the enormous consequences of its every move. It cannot stand still, for the world around it seethes with the fires of conflict and the tides of history. On a pristine morning in September of 2001, those tides reached the walls of the Pentagon, and it reeled as never before. There's just this atmospheric change that happens as that 757 breaks your airspace and slams into the side of your building. Just as the building was breached, so too was a sense of invulnerability. Not only must it rebuild, but also it must transform, reinventing itself to combat the ever-changing threats of a new kind of war. More than any other institution I can think of in the world, the U.S. military's attention really has to be on all things at all times. They don't know where the next war is. This enigmatic place is the sum of many parts and many people. The Pentagon is more than just a building. It's almost like a living, breathing organism. It is an institution as complex as any on Earth. A place of war, power, and tradition. It is filled with history, and it is history-making. It is the extraordinary building known as the Pentagon. Young men have gone to war since civilization began. The United States has been called upon to send its people into battle again and again. For the last 60 years, the call to arms has come from inside the Pentagon. This is the home of the U.S. Defense Establishment, one of the largest institutions in human history. The Department of Defense and its armed services are headquartered here. Over 200,000 telephone calls will be made here today, and as many as 30,000 cups of coffee will be drunk. 4,200 clocks will tell time, and perhaps more than a million emails will be sent and received. At dawn, the halls begin to fill with a mix of military and civilians. There's a real rhythm to the building. It starts very early in the morning, 4, 4.30, and it tends to be uh, the military are the ones that show up the very earliest. And by 6, 6.30 in the morning, it is at full tilt. An extraordinary range of events takes place here on any given day. The Secretary of Defense will meet with a key foreign leader. One of the Pentagon's war rooms is buzzing with information from the battlefield. Thousands of miles away, the troops the Pentagon has deployed are putting their lives at risk. Where's that the fire coming from? And for the first time since World War II, a young pilot searches for enemies in the skies above the Pentagon. At this crossroads of warriors, strategists, and bureaucrats, General Jack Keane, the Army's Vice Chief of Staff, has two major topics on his mind. His combat troops and the future of his service. The Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. All right, guys, grab a seat if you can. The Army is always evolving. And we're going through a period of our history where we're making some significant change, and we refer to that as transformation. Because when we look at future wars and the needs of the Army, we want to make some rather profound changes in the Army. And the question is, as we're going through time here, 
on a go-to-war footing? Would you rather invest in mobile assets, those things that can move around and put combat power on something, or fixed assets? And the clear choice is mobile assets right now, especially with the other two things that I talked about. Keene has his hands full, fighting battles in the conference room one minute and planning the real thing the next. He's standing in for his boss today in one of the Pentagon's most tightly secured rooms, where cameras are rarely allowed to go. This is the tank, the inner sanctum where the Joint Chiefs of Staff meet. They are the very top of the military food chain. The leaders of the armed services, Army, Navy, Marines and Air Force, advise the President and the Secretary of Defense from this room on all military actions. Usually those sessions are, are fairly restricted. We don't bring a lot of staff into those. Uh, by the time we get there, uh, we expect the, the service chiefs and, and myself and, uh, and General Pace, the vice chairman, to understand the issues and we go in and we might get a briefing or a presentation by somebody, but then when we get into our serious deliberations, we just do that by ourselves. From behind this door, they reckon with the war in Afghanistan, one of the front lines in the global war on terrorism. The war the Pentagon is fighting is mostly an unconventional war. Special operations forces, small teams of highly trained, heavily equipped fighters were among the first to be flown in. Their job was to lay the groundwork for airstrikes and to organize the Afghan resistance. The basic unit that does that is a special forces A team. Um, there's 12 members on the team, all having specialties a weapons expert, a communications expert, a medical expert, and they all are used to culturally assimilating themselves in foreign countries. The elusive nature of the terrorist threat is demanding a radical shift in how the Pentagon is thinking about how it fights. We have not had to construct a global military strategy to deal with the threat since World War II, and that is very different than what our operations have been post-World War II. The new strategy must confront a constant from all battles past, the fog of war. Combat is a chaotic affair, and commanders don't necessarily know what is happening until after the smoke is cleared. A friend of mine used to compare that that fog of battle to playing a chess game in a, literally in a fog where you not only can see very few of the opponent's chess pieces but you can't even see all your own chess pieces now as the Pentagon is pushing hard to transform 21st century warfare stunning new technology may sweep away some of that fog for the first time in history Night vision goggles allow soldiers to see more than 150 yards under nothing but starlight. High-powered weapons with the ability to hit a target from great distances are becoming the rule, not the exception. Even with military might unmatched anywhere in the world, no one is underestimating the task. This is very serious business. I've been in the military now almost 37 years. Uh, there's been nothing more important than we've been ever, ever been asked to do than this particular task. In Afghanistan, the Pentagon is waging a 21st century battle with a tribal culture. And technology alone will not ensure victory. Even in times of crisis, the Pentagon fights more than military battles. It must also wage a war of words. In the press office of the Secretary of Defense, the goal is to keep the message clear, consistent, and controlled. Yesterday in the morning shows, both the Vice President and the Deputy Secretary of Defense spoke about what's going to happen to those um, folks that are captured, either Taliban or Al-Qaeda. So we're just going to compare to see what the Vice President said versus what Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz said to make sure that we're being consistent. Despite their mutual wariness, the Pentagon has made room for the press on its premises. 
We are, I think, probably the only Department of Defense or Ministry of Defense in the world in which the press corps is actually stationed here with us in the building, free to roam throughout the building. In their small offices, journalists like correspondent Jim Miklaszewski are prepping for another intense day. Miklaszewski has been covering the Pentagon on and off for more than 15 years. The Pentagon itself has about 17 and a half miles of quarters. And to get news out of this building for beat reporters, you have to walk seemingly every inch of those 17 and a half miles. Uh, because much of the information that we're dealing with uh, is information that cannot be conveyed uh, over the telephone for various reasons. Some of it is classified. And so you really have to sit down and meet face to face with people, and that requires quite a bit of legwork on our part. The hallways of the Pentagon seem endless, which in fact they are. Some 23,000 people work here. Once they arrive, many don't leave for the whole day. They don't have to. This is a world unto itself. The Pentagon offers many of the services and amenities found in any small town. It's an amazing building and it's an amazing family. There are some 23,000 people here and it's extraordinary how in a very short time you get to know a lot of them. And different hallways are, are like the neighborhoods. One area of the building is unreachable these days, though. The three outermost rings between corridors four and five. Nearly 400,000 square feet were damaged in the September 11th attack. It was 9.38 a.m. and the building was in full swing when the plane hit at close to 350 miles an hour. I saw that plane coming right at me, but he, he picked up a little bit as he, he wanted to put himself right in a window on the first floor. And the plane came right over top of me. I could see all the windows on the right side going by. There's just this atmospheric change that happens as that 757 breaks your airspace and slams into the side of your building. It's like a whoosh. The flash, uh, the tearing of the metal, the ripping of the wood, the, it's the force that hits you. There was a sudden noise, a sound as if there was an earthquake. And there is this vacuum that happens, and you can hear the explosion at the same time that you're feeling it in the core of your body. But just as the lights went out, I was looking at an officer who was uh, across the table from me and I was confused because debris was also falling and I wasn't sure whether or not the debris fell on one of the two people who were sitting near me. We have an airplane that crashed into the Pentagon. The plane slammed into sections of wedges one and two, largely occupied by Army and Navy personnel. David Thayall and Carl Monken shared an office barely more than 30 yards away from the point of impact. I was blown about 20 feet into the, the, the remnants of the office next door, but it, it wasn't as though I was this lone trajectory flying through the walls. I mean, everything just gave way. There was a lot of smoke. It was very putrid black smoke, and it was burning the lungs. It hurt to breathe. The vacuum caused by the explosion just sucks the air right out of you, so you're, you take a breath and you don't, you almost hate to breathe in because you know what you're getting into. And so you know that you have a limited amount of time uh, to get out of there. When I landed, I still had the phone in my hands because I remember doing a double take as I looked at the phone and dropped it. And in an instant, you realize that you're in, in basically entombed or entrapped and all the stuff that's been thrown on you, your cubicle, your desk, you're still in your chair and then immediately the, the call for uh, your awareness that you still have your buddy, thank goodness, is alive. He's saying, Carl, Carl, five times, are you okay? The desk and everything else came with me, and it just deflected the fireball. The fireball passed right over me. We knew we had to get out, trying to find our bearings. We need to go this way, but we had no direction. We had no sense of origin because the walls were gone. It was just absolute and total destruction. Local emergency services were on the scene, working to get the injured out and move everyone to safety. Inside, the fires raged. 
threatening the lives of rescuers and the trapped alike. Nancy and I ran back into the building, and this time one of the cars closest to us blew up outside. It scared me to death and knocked me down inside onto the floor. And in getting up, um, I noticed this bright flash go by me, this orange flash. And I, I was afraid, that, um, I mean, I covered myself because I was afraid perhaps it was part of the, the ceiling caving in or something. Um, and you couldn't see anything else for the smoke, just, just this bright glow. And whatever it was ran by me and bounced off the window and then bounced back down on the ground. It was, it was a person. Uh, the front of this person was on fire, and he was trying to get out to that window. We tackled him, smothered the flames, and he's, he is so pumped up on adrenaline now, he's screaming the whole time, go get the people out in the corridor. There are people behind me. Please go get the people in the corridor. We carried him all the way out, handed him off to somebody else, and that's when we ran back again and tried to get through the door, and we were stopped by the firemen. We wanted to get in there. We knew at first hand what we had saw inside. If we didn't hurry up and get back in there, there wasn't going to be anybody else left. Um, because we, you could see uh, people burning in the, in the windows. We have an unwritten code in the military that states uh, you will never leave anybody behind. Whether you're, you're injured or whether you're dead, you will never be left. You will always be brought out. And this was a combative situation, you know, you had all the sounds and the smells of combat, you know, you had the screams and the cries and the death and the wounded, um, but yet Although the fire department was doing their job, and I'm glad they did, we had to leave our comrades behind. And I, I know uh, that in my heart we could have probably got them back, or I was going to at least die trying to get them. Later, uh, one of the battalion fire chiefs told me that they had found 15 bodies stacked up inside on, in the corridor. And in. I try not to dwell on it. I can only imagine that these were the people that this gentleman was talking about and that they were trying to get out and, you know, perhaps their way was blocked. I, I just don't know. One hundred eighty-four victims at the Pentagon site were among the thousands of lives lost that September day. It seemed inconceivable that such a thing had happened, and in an instant, it had changed the Pentagon forever. Not long after the fires finally subsided, the restoration effort began. The man who is leading the charge is Lee Evey. Evey and his team are working under an intense deadline that echoes that of the building's original creation. The Pentagon construction started on September 11, 1941. So it was 60 years exactly to the day that this crash took place. In the months before ground was broken for the Pentagon, it was clear that for the U.S., war was imminent. Europe was already in battle. It was an anxious time in the nation's capital. In Washington, the War Department was dispersed throughout the city, perhaps 17 different buildings, and it became quite clear this is not an efficient way to do business. The man who would be behind the new building was General Brehan Somerville, Chief of Construction for the War Department. Somerville was a pile-driving man. He was a very strong, forceful character, ruthless, determined, and because he was very effective in getting things done, even though he was unpopular and even disliked by many of the people who knew him and worked for him or with him, he had the support of his superiors. In the heat of a Washington summer evening, 
on Thursday, July 17th, Somerville ordered a small group of engineers and architects to draw up a plan for a fireproof, air-conditioned building that could hold an unprecedented 40,000 people. It would be the world's biggest office building. Amazingly, on Monday morning, plans were submitted for a five-sided building which harked back to the pentagonal shape of many old forts. The new fortress would be in northern Virginia, just across the Potomac River from Washington, which had little room for such a huge structure. At one point, President Roosevelt wanted a building with no windows, perhaps for safety reasons. But munitions experts told him that without them, a bomb would do far greater damage. Though the plan changed more than once, the shape never did. Less than two months after its conception, construction began. Even with 4,000 men working three shifts, progress was sluggish. At this rate, it would have taken eight more years to complete the Pentagon. Then came December 7, 1941. There are a number of reasons why Pearl Harbor took people by surprise the way it did. I think for Americans in December 1941, as indeed in September of uh, 2001, there was something shocking about the sight, about this beautiful day being suddenly marred by an attack which seemed to come from nowhere, which left thousands of people dead, which involved an enormous amount of graphic destruction. Spurred on by the attack, construction shifted into overdrive. The Pentagon would be built in only 16 months. They used 15,000 workers. They worked 24 hours a day, and they got all six and a half million square feet completed in 16 months. By the following spring, people were already installed in the unfinished building. That May, the government declared the building would be called the Pentagon. In the dark days of World War II, there was no special ceremony to commemorate the Pentagon's completion. People continued to move into the building 24 hours a day at the rate of about a thousand a week. They were engaged in a mission, and thousands of miles away, so were the armed forces. Throughout three and a half years of war, the Pentagon supported the troops and saw them through to victory. It had been proposed that the Mammoth Building could become a storage facility after the war. But by 1945, the Pentagon had become as immutable a symbol of Washington as the Capitol. A few years later, the War Department had become the Department of Defense, and the Pentagon was its permanent home. Over the decades, hundreds of thousands of people have walked these halls. For newcomers, it can be like traveling to a foreign country with its own customs and language. 1300 to walk through all five of those plus, the PEOs to present the path forward to OT for MCS, FPCB2, and ISISCON. The PEO will also present the path forward to the IV OT. And I remember going to a budget briefing. And I remember the briefer put up a slide uh, with type about the size of the stock tables uh, in the back of the paper. This slide jammed with letters, and I'm trying to read it, and they kept talking about I can't remember what the acronym was, but they kept using this term you know, the, 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 the spam jam or whatever it was. And that's what it sounded like to me. So finally I turned to this, I thought, I'm the only one in the room who doesn't get this and I feel like an idiot. So I turned over to this four star and I said, sir, what's the spam jam? And he said, I haven't the faintest idea. So I didn't feel so totally lost. Pentagon warriors come in all manner of disguise. Some are dead ringers for civilians. I took myself out of the field, out of the battle dress uniform, the muddy boots, 
where I spent my whole career in the woods, basically transformed overnight, set the uniform aside, put on the civilian clothes, uh, grew my hair long, and tried to blend in as much as possible. Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson has seen combat more than once. His Pentagon persona is Congressional Liaison, a lobbyist who fights for the Army's budget. Well, Brady doesn't know what we're at. Okay, I'll let Brady in there for another. The Pentagon's funding has often been a source of no small amount of controversy. A wash in politics and charges of recurring excess. Yeah, they promised to put, to put DRF money... Uh, With figures sometimes topping 15% of the federal budget, defense spending can come under heavy fire. It is Congress that has the final say in just how much money the Pentagon will get. Anderson's responsibility is to see that the Army's leaders are ready to answer questions from members who may have their own agendas for military spending. It's General Jack Keane's turn in the hot seat. Anderson is there to back him up. The Colonel has served under Keane at three different posts over the years. General Keene is, is a no-nonsense, hard-nosed soldier who grew up in New York, and um, soldiers intuitively are drawn to General Keene because he is a soldier soldier. The unfunded requirements were $8.7 billion. Hey, LP, how you been, pal? You guys doing all right? Just fine, sir. That's uh, great seeing you. Hey, guys, how are you? How are you? Yes, Good to see you. You all doing okay? Always, sir. Good morning, guys. As much as you want to stay a field soldier forever, it's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is also to come here to the headquarters, the greatest military in the world, and provide the talent and the experience that you have, and, and hopefully some insightful judgment as well, to help those in the field. So you, you, you feel good about being here. It's not like jumping out of airplanes with soldiers at night and riding in helicopters with them. My life in the past was an association with soldiers, sergeants, and I missed that association, and no doubt about it. But being here is the right thing to do. And thanks for what you're doing out here. I mean, you know how important this is. This is a battlefield here. We already know that. I mean, we've had 184 people killed here. In its time, the Pentagon has experienced both triumph and disaster. Some 30 years earlier, it was rocked by a very different war than the one that is waging now. No era was more difficult or damaging than Vietnam. The after effects are still being felt. There's a sort of never again mentality inside the U.S. military that's been passed down through generations of officers about Vietnam. I'm not sure it's always the right lesson, but boy, that lesson still looms very large in the U.S. military. Vietnam was like nothing the Pentagon had ever encountered. What had begun as an effort to stop the spread of communism became a trap from which there seemed no escape. American officers felt enormous pressure to succeed, which led to frustration and ultimately a great deal of deception. The basic belief that seems to be pervasive in the U.S. military is that civilians meddled in the Vietnam War, that the lesson of Vietnam was that the politicians got too involved in the basic decisions about the war. Outside the Pentagon, public fury was increasing. The protests reached right up to the walls of the building itself. There was disillusionment within the ranks as well. Those might, to some, sound like harsh words. But at some point, the leadership of our country understood perfectly clearly that this war could not be won in Vietnam. And yet they continued to send in young men and women to die and went to bed at night and slept well. And I hope to God we never do this again. And I think everyone who is a civilian leader, whose job it is to send young men and women into harm's way, um, 
better look themselves in the mirror every night and say, have I sent them knowing that they cannot win? That they're going there for naught. And I think in this country this occurred. In 1975, when it all finally ended, the credibility of the Pentagon was in tatters. At its lowest point, the youngest Secretary of Defense ever was sworn in, 43-year-old Donald Rumsfeld. Everything suffered during the Vietnam War. It was the era of guns and butters both, and, and in fact the guns suffered because all, everything in the military invested in went for Vietnam. The other thing was there had been demonstrations here and the various people throwing blood in the front steps and that type of thing. The building had been closed, they'd never had any public tours, and, and they turned off every other light as you went down the halls in this building, and it was a dark, dreary, uh, not a happy place to be. So. I decided what we ought to do is turn the lights back on, have public tours, and dedicate some corridors to NATO and other groups or activities or people who've contributed to the defense establishment over the decades. Now, after more than 20 years in private life, Rumsfeld is back with a new mission. The Pentagon is not always known for flexibility or efficiency but he wants to change that. The effort has been clouded by the events of the 11th, however. When there's a war, one has to spend a great deal of time on the war. So since 9-11, uh, I suppose a major chunk of my days uh, involved with the global war on terrorism and, and in many instances, Afghanistan. Once a remarkably open place, the Pentagon has severely tightened its stance The DPS, the Defense Protective Service, verifies IDs and passports regularly. If anything is out of place, entrance is denied. This morning, the DPS has seen something they don't like in one of the 67 acres of parking. An envelope has been thrown out of a car. Got a situation going on in lane 13 right now? Somebody drives up in a car, possibly a Dodge Shadow. Pulls up, drops a vanilla envelope in the middle of the lane, and then takes off down to DC. The envelope is lying just yards away from the building. Inside, the Protective Service Unit, the Pentagon's equivalent of the Secret Service, is already on high alert. If you got any concerns about people walking up, make sure we get with the gates. Three of the most important people in the country are expected here in about an hour. All right, today we got a uh, luncheon that's dealing with the uh, vice president, um, secretary of state Colin Powell, and um, Condoleezza Rice, the uh, security advisor. Uh, myself and Van, we're going to be outside on the plaza. While the Protective Service Unit is prepping for the arrival of the VIPs, the Fort Bragg MPs are called in to cordon off the area around the package. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Colonels Ted Anderson and Ron Ellis are headed out to the hill for another hearing. But they are about to run into a problem. Are we locked in? Yes. That's not good. The Pentagon is frozen. No one can go in or out. There's an incident outside. We're going to make that adjustment because of what's going on on the other side of the building. And when we finish with that, maybe something else will come about or maybe another suspicious package, but we'll deal with that when it comes up. The VIPs are expected shortly. Secretary of State Colin Powell is scheduled to arrive first. And we're going to make sure that they get here on time without uh, any problems or anything. And we're going to secure the area, sanitize the vehicles, the grounds and the uh, local public if we have to to make this happen and it'll take about 60 minutes but this 60 minutes has cost us probably about two days of work in the parking lot a bomb squad from nearby fort mcnair has been called in to investigate one of their first steps will be to x-ray the package the dps control center has its hands full literally main 13 now, UD's in route, okay? 
On one side of the Pentagon, three of the country's leaders are about to arrive for a high-level meeting. On the other, a bomb expert is analyzing a package for explosive devices. Detonating it could be dangerous if there is a toxic substance inside. In my gift will go out the metro entrance, and but for as far as the buses are concerned, the cops aren't seeing no more. Like two hours. They didn't or, tell us. In cases like this could be ten minutes, it could be two hours. There were rumors of unidentified residue on the envelope, but it is pronounced free of both residue and explosives. Powell arrives safely and disappears into the Pentagon that he once commanded as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. We don't want the, our, our principal standing outside in harm's way for any length of time over 60 seconds. And in the same regards, we don't want the other principal waiting over 60 seconds for what we would call stopped, which is on the X. When you're on the X, you're a target. So we want to keep the wheels rolling, keep the feet moving. So when the vehicles come up to the steps, the secretary's there, they shake hands, they come in, and the operation goes off smoothly. If everybody has to wait, then someone that's lurking outside has a good chance of setting up a good shot, and we don't want that to happen. By the time everyone arrives, the package has been cleared. But the DPS's job is not over. They looked in there briefly. There were some papers and some paper clubs. They looked in there, they saw there could be something that possibly could have been addressed to the president. Uh, I cannot tell you for an absolute, but it was rambling writings, nothing specific. The incident resolved, everyone is allowed to go about their business, including Ted Anderson and Ron Ellis. Moments like this one are a reminder that life at the Pentagon will never be the same. While the renovation project forges ahead, the work of the national defense continues around it. The mission of the Pentagon is carried out by thousands of people doing millions of different tasks. But no part is more essential than planning for war. There are people right now over at the Pentagon thinking about what if A happens? Could we do B? What Might we do C? Might we do D? And they're writing all those plans up. The Pentagon is full of contingencies and plans for things that you and I have never even thought might happen. That's their job. In 1990, a plan was being devised in the Air Force that would help change the face of war fighting. It was brewing in a small Pentagon think tank, or cell, named Checkmate. It was led by Colonel John Warden, who wanted to open up the sometimes musty Pentagon to new ideas. The old way of thinking about war was very much of uh, thinking that war was a clash of two armies or air forces or navy. And what became fairly clear as we're moving into the mid-1980s was that that was much, much too small a view of warfare. So the concept of the enemy as a system was to think about an enemy as a something that was significantly greater than just the military side of it. The Checkmate team put theory into practice when the Gulf War loomed. They devised a plan for an operation which would target the country's infrastructure as well as its military. It was a rock that would be on the receiving end. Very early on, this whole team said, wow, we've got something that's really powerful. And, and then that feeling maintained itself through the planning and then through the war itself. The plan was possible in part because of innovations in the American arsenal. Precision weapons guided by lasers and able to hit with far greater accuracy than weapons of the past. In World War II, for example, if we wanted to have a very high probability of hitting a, a, a target, you had to drop 9,000 bombs to have a 90% probability. In the Gulf War, with the precision bombs, one bomb gave you that same probability that took 9,000 bombs in World War II. So what that meant was that we could hit a lot more targets with a lot fewer airplanes. 
Within a few days of beginning the air campaign, the Iraqis were stunned by what Warden called parallel attack. And parallel attack meant that many, many things happened to Iraq at the same time, which induced a state of paralysis, which was almost impossible for the Iraqis to deal with. It's sort of a thousand-year flood problem. You simply can't prepare for that kind of a thing. Precision weapons and the strategic use of air power helped make the Gulf War an enormous operational victory for the Pentagon, helping it move past the legacy of Vietnam. Desert Storm worked extremely well because the U.S. military learned the tactical lessons of the Vietnam War. They really went to school on how do we fight better, how do we connect, tr how we train to how we fight. The evolution in many kinds of military technology has roared forward since then. But predicting the future is a tough game to play. There's an enormous tension in the development of military technology between sticking with what you know worked because it worked in the last war and coming up with something new because you might need it in the next war. There can be decades of lag time between concept and execution of weapon systems. And what can seem like a good idea mid-decade can be outdated and a waste of billions a few years later. The debate over how the Pentagon spends its money rises up periodically, often fueled by a bad decision or a failed mission. Still, smart weapons are becoming smarter and smarter. Satellite-guided weapons with GPS technology are the latest thing. This is a representation of a state-of-the-art air-to-surface satellite-guided cruise missile in development by the Air Force. As it closes in on its target, an infrared imaging seeker takes over. It rarely misses. Hardware alone is not enough for the Pentagon to win its wars. It also needs friends. Today at the Pentagon, allies from 29 countries have arrived to demonstrate their support for the war on terrorism. The Pentagon will not release the exact number of countries with an American troop presence, but they are stationed in at least two-thirds of the world's nations. The troops are there at the pleasure of the host countries. In this new age, international cooperation is as essential as it has ever been. Still, the Pentagon is a uniquely American institution. And if the military is not democratic, it is still filled with many voices and many different interests. Think of the Pentagon as a village out there somewhere, or a little tribal group of tribes out there. Power resides in money at the Pentagon. And money is held by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. But it's kind of an embattled little group up on top of the hill. And then running around it are three or four different warring tribes. The Army, the Navy, the Air Force, all kind of circling around it, whooping around it, kind of going after this embattled little group that has all the money and seeking their money. And occasionally those tribes get together and gang up on the Office of the Secretary of Defense. More often, they just fight with each other. The fight may be for recognition or for dollars or to be the ones chosen for an impending operation. This is not combat though. This is North Carolina. It's a display of marine firepower meant to impress and entertain. An In a mocked-up tactical village, the Marines have been trained to fight where civilian and military casualties can be highest. In this exercise, the bad guys are holding the town. The good guys initiate the operation to seize the city. The mini-war features everything from tanks to aircraft to carry out the assault. a crowd pleaser. 
Not too surprisingly, on this day in North Carolina, the good guys win. But all the performance art is a rehearsal for the real thing. The Pentagon sends troops where it is told to. In 1992, it was ordered to deploy forces to Somalia on a humanitarian mission. Initially, there seemed little risk. Over the months, the situation deteriorated and tensions grew. Then it exploded. And so when a firefight developed, during which tragically 18 Americans were killed and uh, a large number were wounded, when that fight came, it was such a shock to the public. In the tragic Black Hawk incident, Somalis brought down two helicopters and the rescue mission went drastically amiss. The nation and the Pentagon reeled. General John Shalikashvili was sworn in as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff just weeks after the Black Hawk incident. He inherited a nightmare. I think what went tragically wrong has haunted us really quite a bit ever since was that we went to Somalia having explained very clearly to the American public why we were going and what we intended to do there. But then, as always in a military operation, things change. Nothing is ever static, and just because you made a plan doesn't mean that the plan is going to be carried out like this. Somalia brought back memories of failure and tragedy in Vietnam. All right, let's mount it up! Over the next years, there was little appetite in the U.S. for rushing troops in just anywhere. You know, in past decades, our country's had a wonderful margin for error. We've had big oceans, and we've had friends on the north and the south, and we could, uh, we didn't have to be Johnny on the spot. We could, we could hang back and wait and see and look around and then decide if we wanted to do something. Not too far away from the renovation site, two flights below ground in one of the most closely guarded rooms in the entire building, an elite group of army personnel is gathered. This is a Pentagon war room. Where you are is in the Army Operations Center. And it's here where the Army does its planning and issues its orders to its forces. And we follow an agenda that's on the screen there. And it starts out with a detailed understanding of an, the intelligence picture itself. What are our adversaries doing? What, are we, what do we think they're going to do? And we try to be as predictable as we can. The new enemy does not have an army or navy that the Pentagon can overwhelm. It is difficult enough to even find them. Intelligence gathering and secure communications are critical in this new war. The Pentagon has incredible tools at its disposal. Military and civilian satellites can send back images like this one of the strategic Kandahar airport from more than 400 miles up. But even this remarkable technology can only do so much. It is the state of the human intelligence gathering that has the Pentagon concerned. I worry about intelligence. I worry about our ability to know what's going on. It's a big world. It's, it's, uh, it is very difficult to find individual people. The intelligence capabilities right now, at least in my view, no, they're not right where we need them to be. If the FBI has a queue or the military has a queue somewhere due to some of our interrogations of some of our detainees, that those queues fly very quickly to other agencies and that they can cross queue and say, ah, oh, now I see what, what's developing or I see this linkage that I never saw before. And that can lead to other trails that uh, either for law enforcement purposes or for prevention purposes or for military purposes could be very, very useful. As enemies of America arise and find ways around its sheer military might, as terrorists have, the Pentagon will be challenged to devise methods to meet those threats. Combat is a giant game of rock, paper, scissors. You bring a rock, 
against the other guy's scissors, so he comes back with paper to wrap your rock, so you bring scissors against his paper. That's all military technology is, is a continuing evolution of what does the other guy have, how do I attack it, how does he respond to my attack. One of the most important developments is the UAV, the unmanned aerial vehicle. They were first used with mixed results, but they are fast coming into their own. Over the next decade, I think that UAVs are going to revolutionize American war fighting in the way that computers and satellites have in past decades. Uh, we're getting there, we're just not there yet. Flown by remote control, the drones, as they are sometimes called, can hover over a hostile area, staring at it for much longer than other aircraft. One of the things that's enabled us to be very successful in Afghanistan is uh, we have air superiority, uh, above 10,000 feet over Afghanistan so we can put aircraft over these targets with sensors on them that allow us to stare at a target for a long period of time. At times, they can deliver the information almost simultaneously to the field commander and the Pentagon. The ultimate unmanned air vehicle on the drawing board is the UCAV. By 2010, it is expected to make its own suggestion about what to attack and after an okay from its remote control operator, fire at its target. Disquieting or revolutionary, this increasing automation of warfare is expected to continue. The leaders here are mindful of the difficult and dangerous mission ahead. They exist in a universe where matters of life and death inform every decision, every act. So I don't think we should be under any illusions about what, what kind of world we live in right now. And that's why it's important that we, we can't build fences big enough to uh, defend ourselves. I think that's one of the things September 11th told us as well. Now we can do a better job, and I think we are in that regard, but we've really uh, got to go on the offense in this particular fight. So what one has to worry about is, is seeing that we stay ahead and that we work harder and smarter and faster at finding those terrorists and the terrorist networks and stopping them before they, they have the opportunity to gain access to those kinds of weapons and kill uh, many multiples of, of the people that were killed on September 11. The Pentagon was created to deal with one of the most terrible expressions of the human race, war. Its success or failure however measured, can affect the future of nearly every country on the planet. Fear it, respect it, look to it for protection, or desire its destruction. Much rests on this stolid, serious place, a grave and simple building called the Pentagon.